Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome to another episode of On the Couch with Creatives. I say good morning because I'm here in the UK, but good afternoon or good evening if you're anywhere else in the world. I'm Melanie Perry. I'm Julie Hyde-Mew. And this is On the Couch with Creatives. Fans and followers of the show will know that we're part of the Creatives Group, the professional network for creative individuals everywhere. No matter where you are in the globe, we like to help you grow, connect and develop your creative business. But this is on the couch. So Julie, who do we have on the couch today? Well, today we are talking to Paul Waters, who is the author of Blackwater Town, a crime thriller set on the Irish border in the 1950s. Paul is also an award-winning BBC radio producer and the co-presenter of the award-winning podcast, We'd Like a Word which focuses on books and authors. Hello, Paul. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you. Lovely to be here with you both, Julie and Melanie. Well, this is going to be an interesting chat because you're quite the cosmopolitan type. Uh, you grew up in Belfast during the Troubles. You were involved in cross-community peace groups and went on to report and produce for BBC Northern Ireland, BBC Radio 4, BBC Radio 5, Live, the BBC World Service and Channel 5. So you've obviously drawn on your real life experiences when it came to writing Blackwater Town. Uh, yes, I have. I used to hear um, it's set in a time a little bit before I was born, but I have heard lots of true stories from that time from people who were involved in a little known conflict back then and in true crime, people who were in the police uh, and other organisations around then. And they told me they used to share lots of stories that never made the newspapers or the history books because, frankly, they were too dodgy and uh, they would get in trouble. And I thought some of these stories are just too good not to tell. But maybe I should share them in a fictional context rather than get everyone in big trouble. And uh, so I took those real life stories that hadn't been told before and added my own imagination and, and created a completely fictional story. But, and it was kind of liberating because as a journalist, I've been telling other people's stories for a long time. And I, st I still do. It's important to give people a platform and to get their voices heard. But I would always... Um, keep myself out of it, keep myself back, try and be objective, let other people say what they had to say. So writing a fictional book then is very different and you can't help revealing things about yourself and you have to uh, come to terms with that. That's, that's a big change for uh, a reporter like me. Blackwater Town, it's, it's a beautiful book. And Thank you. It is. I, I really, really enjoyed it, even at the end when I was in pieces, and I remember you saying to me, it's a bit strong, I was, I was in pieces at the end. It was, I was so emotionally invested in the characters by that point. Um, no spoilers. But it was just like, no, they've got to read it. It's, a, it's just a tremendous book. It will take you on a real journey. Um, and I just thought it was really wonderful. And, you know, it must have been quite extraordinary for people to be living in that time. And as you say, the stories that came out, and your past experiences as a journalist, I mean, you must have seen some terrible things. Uh, I, I did. Well, a lot of people uh, who were living in Northern Ireland experienced, you know, tragic, awful things. And I guess often we tend not to talk about them so much uh, because there are always people who've experienced much worse things than you have. And... Um, Trouble came to our family, but we were lucky, I would say, in in how we got away with it. And um, and there were lots of other people who were who were nowhere near as lucky. Um, I suppose I remember some of the more bizarre things. I remember once I was reporting on uh, a riot. I will it certainly became a riot, and uh, in West Belfast. And, and it was kind of a good natured riot, I suppose. And at one stage, people had hijacked a milk float that was you know, delivering milk in the area. And I was there in my reporter suit as a young man trying to look smart and with my recording kit. And uh, people had gathered around the milk float and they were taking the milk 
they weren't really causing terrible harm, but they were throwing it up in the air and the cartons were coming down and splatting. And it was a little bit like a milk fight. And I thought the one thing I absolutely have to avoid is getting covered in milk because if I come back to the office wounded in some way by a brick or something like that, that would be like a noble, glorious wound. But if I come back smelling of milk and completely drenched in milk, I'll never hear the end of it. That will just be ridiculous. And, you know, I'll have to leave the country with the shame. <laughs> um, but I, I do remember times in more serious situations. I remember uh, once I was on uh, the wall of, of Derry. Derry is a walled city on the far side of Northern Ireland from, from Belfast. Lovely place and lovely place to visit now. And uh, it has these historic walls circling the, the historic city. So I was up there and uh, again, there was more trouble going on and the nationalist protesters had been driven out of the walled city and they were throwing things back, I guess, petrol bombs and bricks and things like that. And the police were on the walls shooting plastic bullets at them, which are, they're supposed to be non-lethal projectiles, although they, they have killed some people and including children and uh to get right in the heart of this and do authentic reporting i thought well i have to be right up there with the police officer on the front line so he was there in his helmet and his visor and his padding on his chest and arms and legs and he had his firearm and his plastic bullet gun and i was there crouched beside him in my suit <laughs> um with my recorder <laughs> and he kind of looked around at me to say I know what I'm doing here but I've absolutely no idea what you are doing here and I thought yeah that's probably I probably shouldn't be here at all but he, you know try and report on things accurately and authentically and occasionally unwisely and uh, luckily enough I emerged from the various uh, foolish situations I put myself into unscathed over the years although I had colleagues who were not so lucky mm -hmm. and, um, and indeed some were injured and, um, and some unfortunately were killed. I mean that's the thing about getting that story isn't it you, you know you you want to bring the authentic feeling the authentic life to to the people that are going to see it but it's it is dangerous being being a journalist in certain situations is is a very dangerous occupation, especially people who report in situations of war and things like that. And I don't think I could do it. So you know, power to you. Well, the answer is uh, wear sensible shoes <laughs> so you can run away fast. Yeah, very fast. And wear a bulletproof vest if you can get one. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you can get one. What I want to know is, did you use the milk incident in your book? Um, well, my book is set in the 1950s, and uh, so I felt that was a, a safe distance from getting people too annoyed, or I thought that would be a safe distance. However, um, I'm so I'm saving up the milk story for a future a future book, but I did have the the book has provoked some strong reactions usually really positive ones like Melanie's. Thank you very much again. But I did have somebody say to me, if you don't change the ending, I'm going to come over and punch you in the face. Oh, no. I just said, I I, I just said, I said to you, didn't I? I said, why? I was like, you know, mascara <laughs> running down my face. I mean, well, the thing is, of course, that threat had the opposite um, result from what the person intended, because I thought, well, I'm provoking a reaction. That's that's great. Strong reactions. That was what's what you want. As my mum said, my mum said, no, he's right. He's right. I don't think that he could have done it any other way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I apologies for the mascara. Oh, what a happy one. Next time, oh, please. Thank you. <laughs> the next one is a lot happier, actually. Oh, good. Let's <laughs> talk about the next one, because you're doing a, a series um, set in India. Uh, that's right. So the first book, Blackwater Town, is set in Ireland, which is where I'm from. The one I've I've finished at the minute, and some people are reading it in um, over in Britain and in India, is set in India because my wife is from India, and we spend a certain amount of time over there with with her family is over there. 
And uh, she said, why don't you set something here? Because we're going to be here a lot. So I thought, OK. So I have done. So it's uh, a Delhi hotelier and an Irish nun solving mysteries together. And you might wonder, what's an Irish nun involved? Uh, that's because I discovered, or my, my wife in particular discovered, that I uh, have a, kind of an auntie who was a, a nun and taught in India for many years. Her whole career was there, pretty much. And she, uh, her final position was running one of the, the main colleges in Delhi, and she was in charge of the children of the Gandhis and, and the elite of India. But as it also turned out, her very first posting was a primary school in Pune, where, as coincidence would have it, she taught my wife's mum and her mum's sisters. Wow. Uh, which seems... Small world. You know, so unexpected. And uh, so I thought, this is this is a backstory, again, that can't go to waste. No. So, um, uh, although my story is completely fictional and it's kind of set in contemporary Delhi and it's uh uh I suppose more light-hearted a bit cozier less murderous oh good oh good <laughs> are, you, are you doing a series of books with uh, the same characters in them that's 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 the plan and so they'll be um uh I suppose if you like the number one ladies detective agency uh that sort of and Father thing. Brown. This, this could yeah. be for you, yeah. yeah. And uh, they'll have various adventures in Delhi and, and other parts of India. And so it's a great pleasure to be there writing and researching. And I'm kind of learning about it. Mm -hmm. And hopefully people in India will allow me to, because it's a kind of an Irish-Indian crossover. It, it sounds marvellous and it's it's right up my street. I would love, because I, I, I love all of the, what I call nice murders, you know, the, the, the nice murders. people still die and, and things, but they're nice. They die nicely over a cup of tea and a scone, you know, so um, <clears throat> Father Brown and um, the number one ladies, etc. I love that. And, and um, Alexander McCall Smith is a favourite of mine and the, <clears throat> the, um, the way he writes about Botswana is just, beautiful and he, he takes you there you get lost and immersed and you could you could be there and I, I just love it so I'm going to really look forward to that Paul thank you uh, you might also like Robert Thorogood's Marlow Murder Club yes I've read that series there um he's the same sort of thing yeah marvellous marvellous you also have a new story in the Taking Liberties anthology of short stories coming oh, out that's, that's... what's that about uh well the uh a, a load of authors who I know um from a uh, previous publisher decided uh, to start a new publisher and the first book from it is going to be an anthology of short stories called Taking Liberties and I have a story in it called Snuffer and the subtitle is How Britain Became a Nicer Place oh. and it's about uh, I suppose the transformational effect of um apps and uh, reality tv and i suppose social media and how uh, uh, uh through some unexpected turns they transform the character of british society um it's only a short story though <laughs> and there's uh, all sorts of different ones in it from um uh from writers of different backgrounds uh including my podcasting colleague Stephen Colgan he has a story in it too oh has he and uh, it's coming out uh possibly by the time this podcast is on air oh well we will all look out for that well let's talk about your podcast tell us more about it well I I, I like writing I love to read I read all the time and I used to do a, a a radio a live radio program interviewing people, often writers. And when I finished doing that, a, another presenter, Stephen Colgan, and and I got together and decided let's let's do a book program, a book podcast. So it's sometimes on the radio, but it's always uh, streaming online on all the usual platforms. And it's called We'd Like a Word, and that title comes from Steve's background as a police officer. 
imagine a hand on your shoulder, you know, we'd like a word. <laughs> and uh, we've had all sorts of writers like Graham Norton, Anthony Horowitz, um, Peter May, and editors and agents and all sorts of people from behind the scenes, poets, nonfiction, science writers like Dr. Erica McAllister. And it's very relaxed. And we chat for about an hour and um, about all sorts of nonsense and what they write, how they do it, what their methods are, what mistakes they've made or all that sort of thing. And uh, it started as um, a fortnightly, although things have slipped a little bit. <laughs> and so it's every now and then now. But uh, we have great fun doing it. And yeah. it's such a pleasure to to get together with writers who are either writing important things or just stuff we enjoy. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so if you just Google We'd Like a Word and podcast, you'll find it on Spotify or Apple Music or mm -hmm. wherever you like. Well, it's, uh, it's quite, uh, I, find, I found it useful to get tips from other successful writers. And uh, so it's a bit like, having a privileged conversation, but just letting other people eavesdrop on us. Yeah, it is a lovely podcast. And if you are a writer or you're interested in writing uh, uh, literature at all, it is definitely worth checking out. And the details are going across the screen now if you'd like to to check it out. But it's it's worth it. Though You've had some lovely guests. And you had Julia Donaldson on as well, didn't you? And she yeah, Julia gave a lot of interviews. So, you know, so um, they have had some really marvellous guests. And and as you say, they're really interesting she was telling us how, uh, I think when she won her Blue Peter Award and she'd had great fun at the award ceremony and she dropped it and smashed it on the way home and oh said, I, can you give me another one? They said, yeah, but you have to pay for the next one. Well, at least she sort of dropped it on the way home and not at the ceremony. <laughs> I wonder if anyone's ever done that. Oh, how embarrassing would that be? That'd probably be me, actually. If I ever got a glass award, I probably would drop it. Not on purpose, but I that's just yeah. Oh god, your worst nightmare, isn't it? Yeah. It's always nice having uh, guests reveal sides to themselves that that you didn't know before. Yeah. That's why I like some reality TV stuff. Not not all, but things like dancing on ice or strictly come dancing when you put a celebrity in a completely different environment that they wouldn't necessarily you wouldn't think that they would be in and then you actually see them as a human being not just the presenter or the personality you actually get to know them as people you think oh gosh you know he or she's really quite nice or maybe not um depending on <laughs> their, their personality type but it is nice and I, I love to study human nature it's it's very very interesting yeah well sometimes after we record a podcast it's interesting to see which guests buy a drink and which ones <laughs> don't yeah yeah and then you don't invite them back again we've rarely had anyone twice actually i think um we've only so far had peter may twice because he wrote uh an interesting book uh, bringing uh, talking about environmental uh, climate emergency that sort of thing into mainstream fiction so we were interested in in that kind of crossover from science fiction or dystopian fiction to normal genre detective stories and he's his most recent book is a winter grave and uh so we thought that was a an interesting phenomenon to look at more generally and so he's the only one we've ever had twice and that's the reason if you could oh, have he bought a drink he did yeah he did he's we, we like him a lot and would recommend his books if you could have anybody at all on on your podcast, whether living or dead, if you if you could have the choice of anyone that you'd really love to to have a chat to, who would it be? Oh well, you made that easier by saying living or dead. Well, living Salman Rushdie because he was going to come on, oh. um, to come over and and join us, uh, and then the COVID pandemic hit and he wasn't able to travel from the United States, and now obviously. He was attacked and is thankfully recovering. Um, so he'd be an interesting one. And uh, um, including people who are dead, Andrea Camilleri. He's a, one of my favourite writers. I like a lot, a Sicilian writer. And also the greatest living Englishman when he was alive, Patrick Lee Fermor, who wrote um, A Time of Gifts about 
and other books, mainly nonfiction, about uh, walking across Europe as a teenager in 1933 and, you know, sleeping in barns and castles. And I think he saw Hitler speak in Munich, all, all on the way from Rotterdam to Constantinople, as I think it still was then. And uh, he writes lovely books about uh, looking for silence in monasteries or walking around kind of rugged areas of, of uh, Greece. And um, he's just um, wonderful pictures, although sometimes you feel you need to have a dictionary handy uh, as you read it, just to keep up with all the, the architectural terms and art terms he's talking about. But um, so Patrick Lee Fermor, Andrea Camilleri and Salman Rushdie, they'd be good. Yeah, they would be good. Living? Salman Rushdie, he said. Salman Rushdie, he said, Julie. Oh, yeah, living Salman Rushdie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who is thankfully still living. Yeah. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Yeah. You know something we don't, Julie. Yeah. Yeah, he did survive that attack. Mm. Yeah. So, what would your top three tips be um, for anybody who would mm. like to, I, I guess, start starting out in journalism or, or broadcasting? What would your top three tips be? be for someone yeah. who's just starting out yeah well i suppose i'll give i give one tip for each kind of category so for journalism broadcasting that sort of thing i think uh it's good to get out and meet people and try and build relationships that's how you get stories people trust you you hear things even if it's not something you can immediately use and these days it's harder to do that because people doing so much digitally which and there's wonderful journalism and research that can be done that way but um there's a tendency for people to be kind of phone monkeys sitting at desks and never getting outside because you're under so much pressure such short deadlines but it's just more fun and you feel more alive going out and you get better stories so that would be a tip for journalism get out and meet people um when it comes to writing i think uh people are scared to start because they think oh it'll be rubbish what will people think uh and i guess the advice would be don't worry about your first draft don't judge yourself just write anything it doesn't matter how bad it is because everyone discards a lot that's writing is about editing so you're going to dump a lot of stuff but you can't dump it unless you do it in the first place so just just write something and don't worry about what anyone will think. That's the best achievement. Most people never even get started, so do that. And when it comes to podcasting, I would say it's good to do it with someone you get on with. So uh, if you're doing it on your own, it can be quite solitary. You've got to arrange the guests. Then the chatting is fine, but then you've got to edit them and do the technical things to post it and have it streaming and all that. Uh, because so I always look forward to recording our podcasts with Steve, because regardless of the guest, I find him entertaining and I enjoy spending time with him and it's fun. So um, regardless of some of the jobs in, involved with it, it's always fun doing stuff with him. So I my tip for podcasting would be like the two of you do it together. Yeah. You know, find somebody who it's fun to do things with. And um, that means you'll stick at it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you motivate each other. Yeah, yeah. And also then, if either of us make a mistake, you two may have a different policy. We always tell guests that we're very kind editors. So if they go wrong or need to repeat anything or get the wrong name, that's OK. We can fix that or fall off a chair or sneeze or something. Unless... I'm editing it and Steve does it. But that also works the other way around. Then he'll leave in my mistakes and I'll leave in his. Yeah, Julie, Julie sometimes just for badness. <laughs> Julie keeps me on the straight and narrow. She, she's very good at picking up things that, that I miss, especially if I'm writing stuff. She'll, she's like the my grammar, my grammar police. You know, she'll she'll double check everything that I do. Because I sometimes I'm just I'm just so busy that I just don't you need a full stop there and you need a comma in there. Yeah, two heads better than one. She's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So, <clears throat> is it that time, Julie? They get my cards out. 
So this, is, this, is a, this is a time now, Paul, where you just have to sit and watch Melanie have her moment. A little moment, yes. A little moment. It hasn't seen the show before. <clears throat> this is this. <laughs> this is. A, I don't. I don't do it as much as I used to. Come on, just let me. Let me have Go my. On. Let me have. It's getting embarrassing. It's <laughs> downright embarrassing. <laughs> It's it's because we play this little game, Paul, uh, called Values Jam. So we're going to ask you, we're going to ask you to pick a card, and then we'll talk about what's on that card. But these cards, they're really soft. They're really soft and silky, and I just love them. And so they're, they're really tactile. And I just sit and have a little play. And then Julie's got her eyebrows up into her hairline, thinking, "Oh my god, she's off again." But they're they're lovely. Yeah, look, she's doing it now. Look, bring those eyebrows down. Look. <laughs> Oh, excuse me. Right. Well, I'll stop now. I'll stop. I'll stop. Stop. Yeah, like, come on. Move along. Move along. <laughs> Let me cough now. I'll get carried away. Get carried away. Right. We won't edit that they're, they're just, They're just my thing. I am. I spoke to Max. We're going to write a film about it. No, we're not. Honestly. Right. <laughs> so I have to pick a card. I'm going to run my finger like you yell stop. Okay, not, stop. stop. Stop right in the middle. Right. What have we got? What have we got? Now, there's no right Ooh. or wrong answer. Um, Paul, just, just what comes into your head. Just whatever pops into that imaginative head of yours. Mm. Exactly. This would be quite good. He's a creative, so this would be quite good. And this is quite a good card, actually, for something that we were talking about earlier in the conversation, because you chose safety. Oh. Okay. So all those risks you took when you were a journalist, what, safety was for me? Um, <laughs> <laughs> as we're creatives, we're going to ask you creatively about safety. So, Paul, what does safety mean to you? What does it look, feel, and sound like? Well, creatively, safety is not a good thing, I would say. In fact, just throw it away completely. <laughs> I, with, when I was writing Black Water Town, Various people were advising me to avoid fair topics, to not write at all. How will people react? There might be some retaliation. People could get very cross because it was, you know, dealing with tough times and, you know, people running around shooting and crime and all this sort of thing. And I hesitated. And then I eventually thought, well, I want to write it. It's it's up to me. It's they can live their lives the way they want to, and um, you just have to go by what you want to do yourself. I, I mean, there's a a phrase about writing. You have to write as if all your family and friends are dead, as in you're not looking over your shoulder, worrying what anyone else thinks, or or trying to accommodate them. And so that's quite a harsh way of putting it, but I think it's uh, probably a good approach. Just write what you want. And it may be, well, you will have to edit it and change it and make it better. But there's no point in taking care or wearing a safety belt or anything like that. Just write whatever you want. See where it goes. Who knows where you'll end up and what maybe you have a destination. I usually have a, a destination in mind, but the way I get there could change along the way. and. Yeah, just set off, leap off, worry about that. whether you have a parachute after you've left the plane. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> so safety, <laughs> out the window, no safety. I, no I safety catch. totally agree with that. And you're a man after my own heart because I'm I, I'm I'm similar. And I've said to Julie, it's, it's not just about sort of writing. It's a similar thing if you're a small business owner, you know, start your business as if your family and friends are dead because they won't support you. I mean, some, some might, but, you know, we, we expect our friends and our family to like our stuff and share our stuff and get as visible, but they don't do it. And it's kind of, they think, oh my God, I'm really terrible. Not if my own family likes it. And it's like, it took me quite a long while to realise, actually, I'm not trying to please those, those lot of people. I actually want to please people that are going to invest in my business, buy into my business and, and, and be like me, essentially. So um, I think that's really, really good advice. What does it sound you, like? You, you have, sorry, before we go on there, basically you start questioning yourself because you think, I don't have friends. All I have are, are Facebook friends who, who just totally <laughs> ignore me. 
you know so so there we go we we when we started creators we thought let's just go for it and as said, whether people like what we're doing or not we're thoroughly enjoying ourselves <laughs> i must admit I've, i found social media a supportive place generally i know that for many people it, it can be horrible but uh, i generally find it interesting i learn a lot and it's a sometimes it's a good place to ask for help mm. and uh yeah i'd find it useful and i i think like when it comes to reviews of my mm. books i'm more likely they're they're more likely to come from people i've never met than yeah exactly uh, than 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 friends and family friends. just yeah. genuine readers yeah exactly for for people that are generally interested in you and we've found this as say friends and family on social media is a bit rubbish but but people that are engaging with our stuff is really is really fantastic and our, our main area is LinkedIn and I found LinkedIn absolutely tremendous and we've met some wonderful people haven't we who are now creators members who are just absolutely fantastic uh, people um, and I love it I love it. it's my favorite social media platform I sort of dabble on Facebook and I only go on Twitter for certain things I can't take too much of Twitter because of the misinformation and some of the stuff that comes out of Twitter I thought I can't I can't deal with that mm -hmm. but LinkedIn is a lovely place to be a lovely place to be and it's and it can be very supportive as you said Paul mm -hmm. and we found that with the creators private networking group yeah. that uh, the members are very supportive of each other it, it's been a wonderful journey it really has mm. and talking of support i believe you have a newsletter out that you are looking for subscribers to as well paul don't you, do you want to tell us a little bit about that oh sure uh well i have a website which is very imaginatively named it's www.paulwatersauthor.com and at that website there is information about me and reviews and there's a really neat map of shops, of bookshops that uh, sell my book because I love bookshops and I, I wanted to kind of support them back. So um, people obviously can buy it on Amazon and that sort of thing, but they can also see an interactive map of the British Isles and just hover over where they live and little dots will appear and with information about a bookshop local to them, not in every county, but most of them. And uh, also you, at that website, you can sign up to a newsletter. And if you do sign up to that newsletter, you'll get some information and you'll also get a free copy of Taking Liberties, the new short story anthology with story from me and and other people in it. Fantastic. And all Paul's contact details have been going across the screen as we speak. So do check check that out. Definitely check out with like a word because it is fantastic if you are into um as I say literature and authors, it's really interesting. Um depending on your disposition, do buy Blackwater Town. If you're quite a romantic and a bit soft like me, brace yourself for the ending. Well, I like to think it's got action and humor romance. and romance. Exactly. It was like up until a certain point where I nearly had a nervous breakdown, it was absolutely fine. Yeah, you got <laughs> to have a little it, light, shade with your light. I know, but I was—I I suppose because this is when people differ. Don't they? My mum, my mum was kind of expecting it, and so to her, it was like a really great book. And I was like, but I really wasn't expecting it, and I was in pieces. And my mum was like, "I'm oh, I was like, "No, I was, I was like, oh, okay, yeah." But it's it's worth a read because it's beautifully written. It's well, really beautifully you. written, and um, and it is an enjoyable read uh, throughout. It really is, um, and I can't wait for your new your new ones to come out because that sounds absolutely thrilling as well. The the the, the nun and the um is it, what what is it the nun and the the hotel owner the hotel owner okay so it's kind of like a really religious and non. Do you have so a name, name the title for the first book in the series? Uh well. If I reveal it here, it has never been revealed anywhere else. Well, I'll tell you then. As it's just us, I'll tell you. Okay. It's called The Disappearing Pilgrim. Oh. And uh, I suppose the two main characters are Avtar, who's the hotel owner, and Sister Agnes, Sister who Agnes. is the Irish nun. Oh, I'm, really, I'm looking forward to it already. I've been right up my street. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really quite excited already. Fantastic. Well, well. 
we shall we shall wait with bated breath for that um on that note we are kind of out of time so i would just like to say a huge huge thank you to you for giving us your time this morning it's been delightful to talk to you and uh don't leave it so long next time is all i'll say well it's a great pleasure joining you thank you very much to you both thank you paul it's been a pleasure